Amen. It's really nice to see your physical eyeballs. I gotta say, I mean, your virtual faces were nice, um, but physical eyeballs are the true and better virtual face. So nice to see each of you. I'm glad that we are back in person. And um, yeah, today we get to actually finish um, our series in Judges. Uh, we're going to wrap up so that we can focus on Easter and do Holy Week this week. And then I will roll out kind of what we're going to do after that into this next season throughout the spring um, next week for us. Uh, but if you remember in this series, we've really been um, kind of tracking through each of the Judges, each of these deliverers deliverers that are raised up um, by God or raise themselves up because they go to stand in the gap and fill this vacuum of this cycle that we've seen throughout Judges of just kind of disobedience and rebellion and redemption and then rinse, wash, repeat over and over and over again. And last week we looked at Jephthah and Pastor Steve, make sure you call him Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve, the bishop himself, um, brought us through Jephthah and looked specifically at kind of the idolatry coming to its completion in the book of Judges. So it was kind of this apex of the idolatry and all of the compromise that we'd seen throughout the book kind of came to a head in Jephthah. What we're going to see today is in Samson, we don't just see the idolatry and compromise come to a head, but we actually see God's judgment of Israel kind of letting them run to the end of themselves, come to its completion. And this is one of the most well-known, famous or infamous stories in all of scripture. And there's been many even pop cultural references to the character and figure of Samson and what he represents. And in the book itself, there's more on Samson than on any other judge. So there's something that changes in this chapter where the narrative pace actually changes drastically in the text, and it speeds up and slows down at the same time. And so as we enter into these chapters, we're obviously not going to be able to read all of the verses. I encourage you to read from chapter 13 to the end of the book this week, and kind of just track with the pace that the author invites us into, and with Samson in particular. Now, why is there more on Samson than any other judge? I'll tell you why. Because Samson embodies everything that's been wrong with every other judge before him. And so all of the themes, all of the motifs that we've seen in the book up to this point get boiled down and kind of writ small into the person of Samson. Boiled down right into him as a person. And if you remember the way we started this, this series, I showed you that the whole book of Judges is a long, sad answer to the question that God asks Israel. And that is, why did you do this? Like, what is this that you have done? And then we see God kind of passively either pulling back or actively leaning in and delivering and, and moving and empowering, but also judging. And we see that throughout the book. And we see that this is a 300 plus year kind of just downward spiral of compromise and brokenness and dysfunction in the people of Israel. But what's most surprising about the book as we finish, and we're going to see it in Samson again, is not that people are train wrecks. Like we already know that. You're a train wreck, you know that. We look at our culture today, we're all train wrecks, we know that. Israel's a train wreck if you're paying attention, right? That's not the surprising part about the book of Judges at all. The most surprising part is that the same God that they abandon and go and worship anything but him continues to pursue them. And that this whole book screams that God is not a God of magic or incantation or manipulation by our faith or our morality, but he is a God that covenants himself to the remnant people to then go be in salt, salt and light to the rest of the world who do not know him. And that is what Judges screams at us, that there is only one hero in the book of Judges, just like there is only one hero in the pages of scripture and throughout the pages of history, and that is God himself. And in Samson... We see all of this wrapped up because Samson is everything that's wrong with everything we've seen so far in the book of Judges. And if you remember the key refrain, and Steve pointed this out last week, seven times in the book of Judges, we have this sentence that Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. It gets to the point where you're like, okay, like how many times are they going to say this? Well, seven, seven times. And this is the seventh time, this is the final cycle in the book of Judges, where we see Israel do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And Samson embodies 
the very conclusion of the book in the very last verse of Judges, which is, in those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their eyes. So it's not just Samson that does it. It's not just a few judges that do it. It's not just a few boneheads in Israel that do what's right in their eyes. It's everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Israel goes from striving to live life in light of what's right in God's eyes to then compromising and simply just living for what's right in their own eyes. And church, this couldn't be more timely for us today. Not only is every single sermon in our culture telling us that we are to live based on what is right in our own eyes and to live your truth and to do you and to follow your heart and to be your authentic self. We're not only just told that and preached that everywhere, but we're also preached that what's good in God's eyes is actually evil and oppressive to our own fulfillment and freedom. And Judges just hammers this left, right, and center so that we would get it, so that we would understand kind of the bleeding out of cultural values and worldviews into the people of God and would empty us of any distinction from everyone else around us. That's what Judges is warning and cautioning us against. And today, the kind of mantra of our culture of just live your truth even, even gets sprinkled on with some spiritual belief in God because if God is real, well, he's definitely not good and he's maybe a cosmic killjoy who actually just needs to progress and catch up. He's just kind of outdated. Like the morality of the Bible is just outdated. God's just got to catch up. And Judges dangles this question of morality for us that our culture is desperately trying to answer today. Who gets to define what's right and wrong? Who gets to define what is good and evil? Who decides and how do you decide? Because in our culture, we have no idea. So we have this constant moving target in our individualistic, secular morality. It's always a moving target of conflicting subjective definitions of what's good, right, true, beautiful, evil, and bad. So our culture is desperately looking for an answer to this question, but it's always a moving target for them because they don't have any foundation to build it on. It's always subject to change in society or based on a cultural moment or based on the moral flavor of the day because everyone's trying to live based on what is right in their own eyes. And this is captured in some of the idols that we worship in culture, some of the celebrities. Oprah Winfrey famously in 2018 at the Golden Globes said, what I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool that we all have. I mean, lots can be said about that. Uh, if you like Oprah, this is your time to not anymore. But, but here, here's the thing. If that's the most powerful tool that we have, then we are in trouble. Are you with me on that? What happens if someone's truth conflicts with another person's truth? What if me living my truth actually goes against and conflicts with everything else that you would live for your truth? What happens when a mom or dad decides that their truth is to go be with another lover and leave their spouse and kids? What happens if, right, right, so you just go down the line and it just falls apart and just gets destroyed so easily. Brett McCracken, strong name, said, live your truth autonomy is as exhausting as it is incoherent. And he couldn't be more right. We are living in an exhausting, incoherent age and Judges shows us this isn't a new problem. There's nothing new under the sun. These cultural things, these cult cultural ethics and narratives have always been floating around. The question that this poses to us is, how are we gonna start to pay attention to some of these other cultural narratives? How are we gonna actually understand that we need to embed ourselves into the only foundational meta-narrative, the only foundational standard for what is actually good and beautiful and true, right and wrong? Because God doesn't need to catch up at all. We need to catch up. And the Bible gives us the most coherent, most life-giving morality and standard that is what is defined to be right in God's eyes. And it transcends history. It transcends the pages of scripture. It transcends culture, ethnicity, age, life stage. It transcends all of that because it's defined by him and for him. 
And Judges just hits us with that. So it's so beautiful. That, that's not even the point of today, but that was just for free, okay? But that's what Judges is getting at us with. It's just kind of holding that up for us. And I'll remind you of something one commentator said, and I read this right at the beginning of the series. I'll read it for you one more time. He said that doing what is right in one's own eyes for the people of Israel and you and me is actually worse than breaking the covenant because it implies that God's word and works have been left entirely out of the picture. Israel is depicted as thinking and acting as though the Torah does not exist, which poses the question for us, is there any difference between an Israelite and a Canaanite? And the the answer Judges gives us is no. The only thing that makes Israel different is the God that ruthlessly, relentlessly covenants himself to them. That's the only thing that makes them distinct. And when they live in light of that and in line with that, they are distinct. They're set apart. But instead of being holy and distinct and set apart and living counter-cultural values out, they're just settling and being happy. Just being happy. Just being cute, comfortable, safe. And that is the same temptation for you and I. And in Judges, we see a canonization of Israel. And today in our culture, we just see this Western secularization of the church. And it poses the question to us. And it's a question that we need to answer and reckon with at the end of this book, that if your views and your worldview and your sex ethic and your morality and what you pursue, what you define as successful, sounds way more like everyone else in the culture, it's probably not Christian. It's probably not. And you will not be distinct and you will not be set apart and you will not be countercultural. You will snuggle in and settle down and do nothing. And this is the strong call of Judges to us. And that all brings us to chapter 13, as we see in Samson. Let's go verse one through five, ready? And the people of Israel again, again, for the last time, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. That's significant. And the Philistines are wicked bad, okay? There was a certain man man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. So an angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, look, behold, you're barren and you have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean, which means she already is doing all that stuff. P.S. Okay. This is not a righteous person at all. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall, here's here's a key word we'll come back to, begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. All right, pause there. Notice that God shows up, the angel of the Lord shows up and does this to somebody who's not, so is nameless, first of all, doesn't even have a name. We're not even told her name, which is significant in a book that's so obsessed with names. You with me on that? Like the author is making this clear. There's nothing memorable or even noticeable about this woman. Nothing even to remark on about her character. And she's actually warned, like, stop doing the stuff you're doing and then maybe the Lord will do this, right? Like, maybe maybe don't do this anymore, but the Lord's gonna do it anyway, right? So this nameless woman, but God is not responding to the cry of Israel for help. You notice that? Israel wasn't like, ah, yeah, I guess we should stop. Lord, please come rescue us. The Lord shows up and doesn't just raise up a deliverer. He handcrafts a deliverer before he's born. You see the motif yet? See how this is starting to point us forward 1,100 years after this to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Already, it's just starting to hold this line of tension where we're anticipating this deliverer. Like, who is this? Who's this gonna be? What is he gonna do? This sounds amazing. God is actually doing this. He's not just calling a deliverer in the flesh. He's actually like tailor making this deliverer from the womb before they're born. But he's not doing this to answer the cry of Israel for repentance or a cry for help at all. He does it because they need it, not because they ask for it. And that is the whole story of Judges. And that's key to Judges, that only God saves. That this is about his grace and love coming at Israel that has nothing to do with Israel. And that is the exact same good news of the gospel. That's why it's good news. Because this is actually coming at you and has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your week. Like it has nothing to do with this week. How much Netflix you watched instead of reading your Bible. How much you prayed or you didn't. How selfish or unselfish you were. None of that has any impact whatsoever on God's desperate affection and love coming at you. Now tell me that's not humbling and empowering at the exact same time. But that's what happens here. That's exactly what God is doing here. This is just an act of divine grace coming to the people of God. And notice that it said 40 years. 
in Judges and through the, the rest of Scripture in Hebrew, 40 years is a, is a significant number. It symbolizes completion as well, just like seven, but specifically a completion of a process. So this is the completion of the judgment on Israel. That, that's what we see here. So with Jephthah, last week we saw that their idolatry was complete, right? Sevenfold worship of pagan gods. Now this 40 is showing us that their judgment is complete and God uses the ultimate judges and oppressors in the Philistines. Now, if there's any bad guy throughout scripture, it's the Philistines. Like they are wicked, bad in every way you can imagine. But here's why they were attractive. Because they were advanced way beyond, way superior to Israel in almost every single way. So there was something that you're looking at the Philistines going like, wow, like they're, they're pretty amazing. Like they got like amazing stuff going on. Their military, their architecture, their weaponry. Historically throughout the Iron Age, they're the first to actually use iron to make weapons. They're the first people to actually form battle formations for war. But they were cruel, ruthless people. Known for capturing, raping, pillaging, torturing, and mutilating their victims before just impaling them and leaving them there. So that was their claim to fame. So we're talking about a really strong oppressor. And there's not a single time throughout this story in Samson where Israel's like, uh, should we get out of here? Like they've now just accepted this. They've now just gone from freedom to live according to what's right in their own eyes to complete utter blindness and slavery to the point where they're just kind of nestled in now and they're not even worried about getting out. That's how sin works. Sin starts fun. You with me on that? Like sin looks awesome. Like it looks advanced, it looks progressive, it looks fun, it looks, yeah, that's gonna do it. And it starts there, but then it just ends in exactly what we see here, an inability to get us out of the same slavery that we moved towards because we thought it was gonna free us. That's what happens here. And this is crazy because it's the only judge that God promises before they're born. Samson has more potential Okay, than any judge before him, than every judge before him. Like in, in him, he, he, everything that was good about every judge before him, he has. Like he has potential on a platter and he disappoints at every single point. He is the definition of the tragic hero. <laughs> and there's some, some hints before we get out of chapter 13 that this isn't gonna go well, right? There's, there's a few hints. But if you notice the Nazarite vow, in Numbers, in Numbers 6, it, it describes a vow to the Lord and calls it the Nazarite vow. And it, it had three parts, really three things that made up this vow. Number one is that you couldn't drink from the vine. So that's fermented or unfermented. So sorry, Welches, you too, right? So no grape juice and no delicious fermented vine. Number two, you couldn't cut any hair on your body. All right, so I know we like Sunday school eyes Samson as like the rock, but maybe Duck Dynasty a bit, right? Like... Duck Dynasty meets the rock. But I think Samson, although he's strong, I think he probably looked like a complete scumbag. Like you're talking, not cutting your hair, period, ever. Like go home this afternoon after like worshiping the Lord and stuff, but go home and Guinness Book of World Records longest hair ever. It's not a good look. Like, like, like I mean, more, more than just like Duck Dynasty meets the rock, it's probably more like, I mean, Rastafarian meets jungle. Like it just, it wouldn't be a good look at all. And he does have dreadlocks, P.S., so that's, that's good. He was the first dread before dreads were dreads. And third, no contact with the dead. Samson, throughout this story, literally and repeatedly breaks all three of these vows over and over and over and over again. And not by stumbling into it. Like, he blatantly does it over and over and over again. Not only does he break these three vows, but the author was intentional on making us see that he also breaks several of the Ten Commandments as well. And he's just showing us we're, we're dealing with a lawless, law-breaking person. And he does it blatantly. He touches tons of dead stuff, human and animal, right? Uh, he attends, there's a Hebrew word for the feasts that he attends. They're literally drinking parties. Okay, so college bash before there was college bashes. He's there. He's probably drinking, all right? Just throwing that out there. And then third, he ultimately loses his hair and everything else that God has given him. All right, that's how the story goes. And notice that it says that he just begins to rescue Israel from the hands of the Philistines. This is already starting to point us forward to someone who will fully rescue. And but before we're out of chapter 13, we see some hints that this is gonna go really bad, really fast. The 40 years already shows us that this is the longest oppression that we see in the book. 
Twice, if you notice, in the angel of the Lord coming to Samson's mom, he mentions barrenness, which is one of the curses mentioned in Deuteronomy 7 for breaking the covenant. So it's not a good look, right? Three times in these verses, we already have mentions of breaking dietary restrictions, which speaks to Israel's disregard of Torah and ritual purity. And Samson's mom also, when she goes and tells her husband what the angel of the Lord says, she literally leaves out the most important thing that the angel said, which is that Samson is going to come and deliver Israel from the Philistines. She doesn't even concern with that part. She doesn't even care about that. Then they start asking all these details of the angel. That's always funny. And the angel's like, I'm not telling you my name because it's too wonderful. And you're like, oh, cool, all right. Like, you notice that? You like play with God. You're like, no, God, I'll do it. But if you just tell me a few more things, then maybe. And God's like, I don't know that to you, pal, right? That's what the angel said. He's like, I'm not even going to tell you my name. And then he like jumps in fire and floats up to heaven. They're like, oh, it was God, right? So anyway, read that later, okay? That's how the story goes. And last but not least, this is crazy. Samson's name is Sun Man, which sounds nice except for it's a tribute to the Canaanite sun god. And he's named after a pagan goddess and idol. So already there's like flashing lights of like, nah, the story sounds like it starts really well, but it's probably gonna go bad. And we start seeing that happen in chapter 14, verse one through three. So Samson went down to Timnah. Now Timnah was really deep in Israel, by the way. So the Philistines are really deep in Israel. Okay, so that's how much the takeover has happened. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah, he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. He's like, oh yeah, baby, look at her. Then he came up and he told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now go get her for me as my wife. So already, I mean, rude, right? But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman from among the daughters of your relatives or among our, all of our people that you must go and actually take away from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. All right, now the rest of chapter 14 and 15 is just unpacking this exact thing right there, which is Samson's biggest problem. Samson's biggest character flaw is that he is going to go and live for what is right in his own eyes. And all throughout the story, church, this is mind-blowing, all throughout the story, we see the key Hebrew words that he sees, he takes, and he eats. He sees, he takes, and he eats. What does it remind you of? Where does it hyperlink us? Well, it sits us right back down in the garden. And it transports us back there to sit in front of two different ways of living. Two different trees. One that offers life. One that offers goodness and flourishing based on what God defines as right, good, true, and beautiful. But we also have another option that we can go after knowledge independently as an autonomous self and go and live for what is good and bad. And that's what we get from this story is that Samson is the definition of the one, the fool who didn't go after the tree of life, but after, went after independence from God after the tree of knowing good and bad. Why? Well, because it looks beautiful. It looks good. It's green, it's lush, it looks good, but it's a false tree of life. So he ends up doing what is good in his eyes. And as we see this story go on, it offers counterfeit life ends up in death, chaos, destruction, and ultimately exile from God because at the end of the story, we see a very, very ominous, scary sentence, and that is the Lord left Samson, leaves him. And the wording that we get in Genesis is that they saw that the fruit was good. And notice it leaves out the bad in Genesis. God already said it's good and bad. And they're like, yeah, but it looks pretty good. Like, so already they're defining like, ah, I don't know, debatable, God. You know, all-knowing, all-powerful being, like debatable, right? They saw that it was good. They wanted it because it offered to make one wise. So they took it and ate it and then gave it. All the same words that we see throughout the story of Samson. And the theme of Genesis that kind of gets transported over here is that when God gives, it's good. <laughs> but when people take, it's bad. And sin enters the picture by placing human beings and moral decisions and a definition of what's right and wrong at the center instead of God. And that's what the false tree of life offers. And Samson is just running after it left, right, and center. And instead of chasing enemies out of the land, he's chasing women. Right? That's what we see in this, in this, in this character. 
So the narrative arc of the Bible, and this is what's important to see as we go through series like this, the narrative arc of the Bible that gets picked up here is that everything wrong with the world, whether it's just sin or brokenness or lies or anger or racism or injustice or murder or oppression or abortion or greed or whatever you wanna say, stem from, listen, the wrong answer to the right question. All of that stems from the wrong answer to the right question. The right question is, did God really say? But we answer that wrong. Because in the garden we go, well, he kind of. And then we start to fudge around with what God actually said. And it's like, well, but it's 2021, bro. Like live your truth, right? I don't know, God's kind of have to catch up. That was like cultural. That was like for that day, right? Like, so we got it. Let's progress, man. 2021, baby. Okay, and so this is what we do, right? So we give the wrong answer to the right question, which is, did God really say? Church, if there's anything we have to get back to is, did God really say? And then we gotta get the right answer to the right question. And that is what's gonna give us a foundation. That's what's going to allow us to sit down in front of the tree of life and go after and actually taste and see that God is good and not go and take for ourselves, but actually be recipients of what God gives and it's good. That's what we see here in the narrative arc. And it's so true today because we give the wrong answer to the right question. God's not God. God's not good. He's not for you. He's not after your satisfaction and joy more than you are. He doesn't care. He doesn't see you. He doesn't hear you. He won't heal your brokenness. He won't love you. So we go and we define what's right and good for ourselves, and what's right in our eyes. We see, we take, and we eat, and it kills us. So we have to see that all of that is wrapped up in Samson because Samson's, his impulsive, self, self-absorbed, violent temper, womanizing, hedonistic lifestyle is the biblical definition of independence from God. Like that is literally, so it's just like, that, that's what culture is. Why? Well, because they don't live with God and for God. So again, like as a church, it's like we can look at the world and, and the culture and be like, oh, so dark and sinful. It's like, yeah, but they're blind and sinful. Like that's what they are, right? So that, that's what happens here. Impulsive, self-absorbed, hedonistic, and self-centered. That's what Samson is. Uh, First John picks that up in the New Testament and defines worldliness, the idea of like anything apart from God, right? So worldliness isn't like the world, but worldliness is anything apart from godliness, right? And he defines worldliness in 1 John 2 as three things, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, which in other words is anything that feels good, looks good, and what you think makes you look good. And that is our culture. And that is Samson. And that's your heart and mine. That we would go live our truth. And then we go follow our heart. And Samson is literally the best example of him living his truth. And it ends in an absolute disaster. And so understand what what the biblical author is doing here. It's inviting us into this world to actually track with it and trace to the end of this. I mean, some of you know way more about the Marvel universe and all the intertextual, it's like Easter eggs in that movie than you do in your Bible. And then we wonder why we don't see this stuff, right? Stop studying the Marvel universe. Like put down the MCU, pick up your Bible. You'll start seeing this stuff. You'll start seeing the hyper textuality, the hyper links. You'll start seeing the Easter eggs. You're like, oh, that's an Easter egg to the garden. Rawr. You'll be coming and telling me this stuff. I don't have to tell you anymore, right? That's just a loving rebuke. The MCU is nice though, PS, it's all good. Here's two things I want us to see about Samson and then we'll apply it. Number one, He has no self-control, none whatsoever. There's not a single time that Samson says no to himself for anything that he wants. Not a single time throughout throughout the the passage, not once. He's impulsive, he's self-absorbed, he's completely undisciplined. There is no restraint whatsoever in anything that he does. He says no, never. And Proverbs 25, 28 says, a man without self-control and lady is like a city broken into and left without walls. With no self-control, you have no defense left. You're done. You might as well just, you're done. Uh, Galatians 5 picks this up. We know the fruit of the Spirit. What's one of the fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. And that's actually evidence that the Spirit of God is, is, is indwelling you and changing you and transforming you, that you have self-control, that you actually say no to things. And the Bible speaks of self-control in three different categories. I'll just sum it up for you. Desires, so that's like emotional life. 
So anger, love, emotions, right? We just, they don't take us away. We actually, we control them. We, we manage them. We understand them. We hear our emotions and then we, we read our dashboard well and then we act accordingly, right? That's number one. Number two, appetites. So whether it's food or sex or entertainment or spending, whatever it is, whatever those appetites are, you're not just a, a victim to your appetites. That there's actually self-control, there's restraints. There's times where I say, no, because, right? Then I go into Netflix, I'm gonna turn it off. No, why? Because I can go do something else, right? Like sexual temptation, no, I'm gonna flee from it. Why? Because it's better, right? Like there's all sorts of ways that this shows up. And third, your will, self-control of your will. That means decision-making. That's, that's the impulsive part here, right? Like discipline, commitment to something. It's like you're a person of integrity. It's like you say something, you're gonna do it. Like, like you commit to something, you do it. You follow through. There's, there's something about your will that you're able to control and have self-control over your will. So that's how the Bible speaks about self-control. And we see none of that in Samson. None of it at all. Psychologists call this the, the hedonist dilemma. Today we see it all over the place where pleasures and fantasies are only enjoyable until you get them. That's the hedonist dilemma, right? Like if you have a fantasy about, oh, if only I get that, or if only I could do that, or if only I could be there and do this, then you get it, then it's like, oh, okay, well, what's next? What's the next thing, right? It's the hedonist dilemma. And we see that as, as Samson just spirals deeper and deeper and deeper into his own hedonism, into his own lack of self-control. The larger gap to fill it with more pleasure, with more entertainment, with more womanizing, with more whatever it is that he wants, he goes and he gets it and it just continues to spiral downwards. G.K. Chesterton said, meaninglessness doesn't come from growing weary of pain and suffering. It comes from growing weary of pleasure. And that's our culture today. I mean, we're just given over to decadence and dopamine hits. And we're crippled by the immediate gratification and entertainment of every kind. We have no self-control, none at all, none whatsoever. Our attention, none of it. We have no restraint. We abstain from nothing because God's a, a buzzkill and it's killing us. And I'm gonna preach on this soon, but I think it's killing us because we don't fast anymore. hundred years ago, Christians fasted twice a week because it was a way to actually get our body and mind into a state of refrain and restrain so that God could actually empower us. But now we don't fast. Like we'd be lucky if most of us fast two times in our life, let alone two times a week. We don't tell ourselves no anymore. And then we wonder why we're addicted to nonsense. Well, because we don't discipline ourselves and practice restraint. So then we're addicted to nonsense. And then the hedonist dilemma picks up and then we, we just want more nonsense. And this is, this is honestly what I see here is that Samson has none of this. And the church is so affected by this today because we are not, we are not doing any better statistically on any of this stuff. Whether it's entertainment, whether it's, it's addictions, whether it's, it's emotional, mental, psychological, whatever it is. So look at your life for a second. Just think about it. Think about your week. How many times this week did you tell yourself no? How many times did you actually restrain yourself? How many times did you say no to what was natural? God forbid, right? Culturally, you don't do that because what's natural is good. So I should just live based on how I feel and what I want. That's literally this, church. I mean, how many times did you restrain? How many times did you have an appetite or an impulse and then you brought it into submission to God? We have to do better because if we're just living and doing what we feel and doing what we want and going after what we see and taking and eating and delighting and we have no self-control as disciples of Jesus, it's impossible to live a life actually delighting in who God is. You know what's wild? Is that you will enjoy God way more when you start to actually exercise self-control. Because then he's actually given space to show up. Like he's actually given space to show you that what he offers is far more delightful than the things that our flesh and we would just want to go after, right? And we see the opposite in Samson. That's the first thing we see. Second, we see that Samson is completely unteachable. Completely unteachable. It's really crazy. Go through this week, okay, and read how many times he says, I and me. He is isolated throughout the entire story. There's not a single godly voice in his life. It's all, it's the Philistines and it's crazy women and a terrible wife, right? Like there, there's not a single godly person talking and giving him advice. And his parents, he just tells them to shut up because, you know, no external authority can tell me what to do because I'm Samson, right? He is completely unteachable. 
Not only does he reject his parents' advice or any external authority beyond himself, including God, no one can tell Samson anything. It's the definition of pride. There's not a single positive godly voice in his life. There's no one around him to correct him. There's no one to teach him. Now here's what's really cool. There's another hyperlink for us. Samson is the epitome, is how the, the epitome of how the book of Proverbs defines what? A fool. He is the epitome of a fool. Okay, watch this. Proverbs 18, one. Whoever isolates themselves seeks their own desire. They break through all sound judgment. Proverbs 12, 15. The fool is wise in their own eyes. Sounds like the garden, right? But a wise person listens to advice. Proverbs 28, 26. Whoever trusts his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be rescued. And last, Proverbs 24, 6. There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Samson is the opposite of all of this. So it poses the question to you and I, think for a minute, are you teachable? Are you correctable? Like, like in real life, like real people in real life. Like, are you correctable? Are you, are you teachable? Do you invite that? And I'm not talking everybody. Like so, some people shouldn't be giving you advice because it's dumb. Okay, but I'm talking about godly voices, godly advice in your life, people that know you, see you, hear you, and are able to come and lovingly give you advice, teach you, counsel you. Not as the fallible word of God, but as somebody that at least in flesh and blood knows you and can come and actually walk with you, correct you, and teach you. Who do you call for for advice? Who do you Google for advice? For instruction, for decisions to be made. Whose voice and opinion shapes your views and opinions most? Even better, are there certain areas of your life that are off topic, off limits for for everyone? There's certain topics, it's like, oh, you can talk to me about that pastor, but don't you dare touch that. Okay, friend, like you can talk to me about that friend, but don't you dare touch that, that's off limits to you. That's, That's dangerous. That's dangerous if we do not have one or two very close confidants that know us, that can actually teach us, correct us, love us. Just listen, there's no such thing as a healthy Christian who's isolated. God will not change you, will not change your life through sermons and podcasts and Twitter and Netflix. I can guarantee you that. He won't do it, but he will. And he promises to change you and I through community and a diverse network of flesh and blood relationships that know us and see us and feel with us and walk with us and speak into us. And Samson is where he's at because he has none of that. And it's tragic. And then for the rest of chapter 14 and 15, it just details the violence and the dysfunction, the chaotic relationships with his in-laws. Amen, anyone? No, good, wise not to say it. Right, he goes, he attends drinking parties. He goes and kills a lion with his bare hands. And I love when the author says, kills the lion like you tear a young goat. I'm like, yeah, well, that's how I tear a young goat. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyone this week is just like, oh, well, he used the tearing of the goat tactic on the lion. That's cool, right? So he does that. And then he like talks to the, the, the Philistines and he says, oh, if you had not plowed with my heifer, this wouldn't have happened. Husbands, don't call your wife a heifer ever. Don't talk about anyone plowing anything with your wife. Samson shows us that, that's good. And then he goes after the woman that is right in his eyes. All of this drama, everything that we see in these chapters leads to more infighting. It leads to him breaking out in a pretty decent riddle actually, right? He has the honey and the lion. He says, out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet. That's cute. Then he burns a bunch of fields with foxes' tails because he lights them on fire. Then he kills a thousand men with a donkey jaw bone. Normal stuff, just normal. Okay, now what is going on in all of these passages? I'll tell you what. A destruction and complete disregard for the beauty and order of creation. And this is again bringing us back to the garden where there's, there's, there's consequences for sin that go just beyond just God in us and interrelationally with others, but that we actually destroy creation itself. And that creation itself suffers as a result of our own negligence and our independence from God. And so we see that. We see that not only does he break his Nazarite vow over and over again, but he just goes and uses creation, takes dominion over creation in all the wrong ways. 
So whereas we were supposed to have dominion to care, steward, kind of care for it and, and make it fruitful, he goes and literally burns it all to the ground, right? That's what's happening in this text. And then we finally get to chapter 16 and we meet the love of his life, Delilah. Watch this, verse four through six. After this, he loved a woman. He's in love. This must be good, right? Anyone fall in love before? It's gotta be good. Okay, he's in love, head over heels, in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said, seduce him and see where his great strength comes from. And by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to humble him. And we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. It's probably a lot. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. First of all, what? Like she literally tells him the reason for asking him the question. And that's why he tries to deflect a couple times. But then a few verses later, we just see this, verse 17. And he told her all of his heart because he's in love. And he said to her, a razor has never come upon my head for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me. I feel that one deeply. And I shall become weak and be like any other man. You see that? He's saying, I'll become like any other man. Why? Not because God leaves me, but because my hair will be gone. You see that? God is still completely left out of everything Samson's talking about. He he didn't even say that his strength comes from God just there. He's like, yeah, my parents kind of did this vow thing to God. And, uh, but if you cut my hair off, like my strength will leave me and I'll become like any other loser man. Okay. That's what the irony is, he's already a loser. Okay. Keep going. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent him and called the lords of the Philistines and said, come up again, for he has told me all of his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in in their hands. So she made him sleep on her knees. What a pathetic loser. Okay, this is literally the scene where now he is totally, he's in the lap of the enemies. And he's just, he's laid out having a nap on her lap. Okay, just again, you should feel how pathetic this is. And she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks, told you they were dreads, of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. I don't know what that means. I don't know if she did like an incantation or what she did. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Get up quick. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and I'll shake myself free. But he did not know that, check this out, the Lord had left him. He thought it was his hair, but it's actually the Lord. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes, sucks, and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Two more verses. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. So they're having a a church service. They're like, this is great. Our enemy is defeated, okay? Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God for they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they called and they they said, call Samson that we may, he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. And you know how the story goes? In his death, he takes out more Philistines than he did throughout his life. He pushes the pillars over, but here's what's crazy. Backtrack a little bit. Delilah's name in Hebrew sounds exactly like the word for night. The whole story is leading us to this point that he is plunging deeper and deeper and deeper into darkness. And night in the Hebrew Bible is always a symbol of moral decay, godlessness. Samson is just slipping deeper and deeper and deeper into darkness. And now he loves darkness, literally in Hebrew. He loves it to the point where he is just laid out on the lap of darkness. He's laid out, his life is now laid out on the altar of the night. That is what's happening in this text, it's crazy. And then Delilah, driven by greed and power, finally gets the secret sauce, right, behind his strength. And what we see at the end of this story is, is here's what we gotta get, is that Samson's end is physical blindness and darkness because the whole story is showing us that he goes from doing what is right in his eyes to not even having any eyes. He goes from from living his entire life based on what's right in his eyes to being completely bound, enslaved, crushed, and blind. But here's what's crazy. You notice that his hair starts to grow back. Now, when I read this this week again, for the first time, I'm like, why did the Philistines let it? Like they should have had a, a prison, like a prison guard, like bicking his head every day. 
It's just like, like before he had like his, his prison food in the morning. He's just like bicking. He's just like, sorry, Sam, I gotta just give you a, a, a fresh shave, right? I could have done it for him, right? Like, but, but they let it grow back. Now here's, here's what's crazy because the Philistines don't have any idea how the God of the Israelites work. It has nothing to do with the hair. They're forgetting though, that this God actually covenants himself to people despite them. And so his strength returns to him as an act of grace, as an act of judgment upon the Philistines. God's strength is still available for Samson after all of this nonsense. That should be what surprises us. After all of his impulsiveness, after all of his disobedience, God's strength is still there. God is still willing to bless him so that he can actually do something good, not because of him, but despite him. And the story ends with Samson praying. That's what's crazy. He actually prays. And there's actually a sign of humility in this, that his pride is finally stripped away. Now listen, you and I don't want this to be what needs to happen to us for us to be humbled. Amen? Anyone? You want to lose your hair too? Yeah, it's not good. Okay, but, but, but Samson, this is, this is it. It's this humbling effect. Like look at the ends that God has to go to to humble this fool. This is an invitation for us to go and just be like, okay, that's not where I want to end. That's not where I want to go. I want to be humbled. I want to come and be humble. I don't want to be humbled by God using anything that he can to do this. And it's crazy because God gives him strength one last time to sacrifice himself to defeat the Philistines. And he kills more in his death than he does in his life. Now to close, let's go all the way back to the beginning of the story. Notice that the author tells us that Samson begins to rescue the Israelites from the hand of the Philistines. He begins to do it. Well, that means that if he's just beginning and then this story ends like this. So remember, as the, first, like, as, as the audience of this text, this is a terrible ending, right? Like, like you're like, oh, I thought he was gonna be the one though. Like I was gonna do it. Like this is, this is series finale. Like some of us, we love series finales, right? Get all your friends together, get snacks right? You sit down, it's like series finale. This better wrap up all of the loose ends or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose it. And then you have a show like Lost. And don't go watch it. If you haven't watched it, please don't waste seven years of your life. Series finale, I actually think I almost walked away from Jesus watching that series finale. But this is this, okay? This is this series finale. This is a terrible finale for Samson. Like it's like, that, that's it? Like what, this cliffhanger, it's like what I thought he was going to. He's beginning to, uh, but he doesn't actually rescue them. So it hangs us with this tension and this anticipation for who will. Who will? Who is gonna come and deliver us? And it points us forward first to King David as the king, as the deliverer who does actually come, if you remember, and rescue Israel from the Philistines, doesn't he? But not ultimately. And it points us past King David to a king, the deliverer, the anointed one who comes to rescue not just Israel from Philistines, from national oppression, but to come rescue all people from the power and penalty of sin. And instead of God raising up a human deliverer and a judge, God himself, the true judge, becomes human to deliver all people. And so this story is pointing us way past David, 1100 years into the future to look at Jesus of Nazareth. And this story is drenched in signposts pointing us forward to Jesus himself. Like Samson, Jesus is promised before his miraculous birth. Both Samson and Jesus are betrayed by someone who had acted as their friend in Delilah and Judas. Both become weak to become strong. Both were tortured, chained, and put on public display and mocked by their enemies. Both died with arms outstretched. Both seemed to be defeated in their death, but actually accomplished their biggest victory in death. But church, unlike Samson, Jesus lived a life not right in his eyes, but what was right in God's eyes on our behalf. And unlike Samson, Jesus was chained not for his sin and his pride and his independence from God, but for ours. And he humbly comes and lays his rightful authority down to become like us, to rescue and redeem us as King of Kings. This story is just full of these signposts pointing us forward so that it would create in us a hunger for the one who is to come the one that we should bow before, the one who we should come and be humbled before. And how fitting 
is, is it for us to finish this series and looking at a text like this on Palm Sunday? Whereas John read from Matthew 21, we see that Matthew 21 fulfills a prophecy and a promise from Zechari- Zechariah 9. 9, and it's a promise about the Davidic, Davidic king, the Messiah. And it says, rejoice, celebrate. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and bringing salvation to you, humble and riding a donkey. As we start the first day of Holy Week and we commemorate Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, he doesn't come in with authority over nations and the earth. He comes in because he already has the authority over all things. And all four gospels stress this. And in the story of Samson, and as we close Judges, it points us forward past every other king we see throughout the Old Testament to the messianic king who is gonna be truly righteous, who's gonna come and truly do what needs to be done to take care of our idolatry, to break the power of all of the non-gods that promise to give us life, to break those down and to offer us life because he is the image bearer of the one true God. So let's celebrate that and pray towards that this morning as we sing. Father, we're so thankful that this wasn't just a plan B for you to show up and do what you've done through the person and work of Jesus. This has always been your plan. From the, before the foundation of the earth, you have planned to come and do this. And that you have left breadcrumbs all throughout history. You have left breadcrumbs all throughout the pages of scripture as you've revealed yourself and your will and your character. And you've pointed us forward to the day that you would come. And Jesus, we are on this side of that. I'm so thankful that we are. And I pray that for this week, especially as we look forward, as we go through Holy Week and we think about you, Jesus, moving into Jerusalem and moving closer and closer and closer to the cross and you taking on Satan, sin and death and leaving all of them powerless just to pick your life back up again, that we would receive that life, that we would come unlike Samson, and we would surrender. That we would come and desire to live according to what is right in your eyes and not our own. And we ask that you would do that in us and through us for your fame and for your name. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.